I'm really troubled by the fact that everybody calls it the Chris Watts case, because when we do that, it means that Shanann and Celeste and Bella and Nico, uh, because she was pregnant as well, it means that they get erased out of their own murder. And I feel very strongly about recentering them. What do you think was likely the motive in this case? Cases are complex. There's never, it, it is like peeling an onion, you know, and th this is one of the cases that confounds people. But I do think that in some senses it is quite straightforward. It's somebody who has got a cumulative repressed emotion, who is entered into this double life, who hasn't got the capacity to deal with the emotions that are now at play with a young lover I have no blame for Nikki whatsoever. You know, when she entered that relationship, she may not have known the entirety of the fact that he was still with Shanann. He said that he was going to separate from her. But, you know, for someone like Chris, who's awkward, who's repressed, who's remote, who's shy. And then there's this gregarious 30 year old that he's hanging around with and doing sports with. And Shanann goes off with the children and he's got these couple of months where he's living as somebody else. It's almost like giving him a, another identity where he's not even going home. He's spending every night at Nikki's and she's saying how great he makes her feel and they're taking these pictures of each other. Um, you know, and he feels awoke from it, that he's in control of the relationship because he pursued her and she pursued him. Whereas before he hasn't had that in his life. And I also think it's significant with Chris Watts. He's, he never had a long term girlfriend before Shannon. He hadn't dated anybody properly. So he's also emotionally immature. He's immature in terms of relationships. And I think that it did all bubble up. He, they were talking about separation. It became final. And it, it was a control mechanism in, in him of rage when she said, you're not going to see the children. I think at that point, there was almost like a snap. And murders don't happen in a vacuum. It's the whole build up to that event. And I think he's on top of her and he gets incredibly angry and he wants control. And that's what he's got his hands around her neck for, to get control and let her know that he's not going to let her get away with it, of taking the children, that finality. It's his way of, he's not losing control, he's taking control. He's showing her that it's not going to happen the way that she's saying it to him. You know, and that's the reality. It's a paradox that really in someone's head, they feel that they're taking control of a situation where actually it shows that they have lost all emotional control when they do something like that with the mindset that they are taking control of, of the narrative and the future. And also why I say that is because afterwards he does dispose of the bodies, but not only that, he calls up the school to say the children aren't coming in and in fact are not going to be going to school and he calls up the realtor. So now he starts to post plan in this bubble life that, of what's gonna happen next. So I don't think all those things were thought through, but it shows that this is his way of taking control and taking control of, of the narrative and what happens next. So many people feel this case is motiveless, but actually when you listen to what he says across time, for me, it's quite clear what happened and it's quite clear what happened on that night. And we do know, certainly from all of my research, that separation is a high risk factor for serious harm and homicide, as is strangulation, um, as is finality, and when there are arguments about child custody. And pregnancy is high risk as well. So you have these clusters of high risk within uh, this particular case and in terms of Chris Watts's behaviour. These cases are rare, as you said, but are they common in those cases that we see to have an affair that's maybe a motivating factor? Well, I don't think the affair is the motivating factor, but it certainly talks to this double life that he was leading. And double lives, I've worked many cases where people have lived double lives and it creates huge stress because you're trying to maintain two separate identities as such. And that creates a lot of pressure and stress. But I do think what's revealing is that in an in interview with the police, he protects Nikki the whole time and he protects, he never talks about her until he's failed the polygraph. And then he says he failed because he lied. He was having an affair and that's his reveal. But he's protective of her the whole way through the interview, not wanting to get her in inverted commas into trouble or bring her 
anything negative. He's protective, and that's telling. He's protective over her, but yet he shows no remorse, no emotion for Shanann and the children. And that's the part the investigators struggle with. Why is this far not, you know, why is this father not stressed, worried, concerned, tearful, showing remorse about Shanann and, and, the, and the little girls? But yet he's very protective of Nikki. And that tells you, tells me, that that relationship is much more significant to him. In, in that moment, in these, I'll call it, it's like a bubble. And I think that's what he's talking about when he calls it a roller coaster. He's in this sort of bubble state where he's divorced from reality. You know, he is not, he, the, the reality was suspended with him living with Nikki and trying to live this double life. But it is, all starts to unravel because, of course, he's failed the polygraph. He's now been given a narrative that it was Shanann that did it. And now he's saying to his dad he was trying to protect her. And I think it's in those lies that are also, uh, you know, very damning about him that if it were a point where he did something terrible and it happened to Shanann, then why kill the two children? And then even on the interview, he at no point show any emo shows any emotion about the children. He just protects Nikki. So uh, maybe in his mind somewhere in the recesses, he thinks that he and Nikki are going to have this relationship. Um, and in the February interview of this year, he does talk about her again, uh, Nikki. So she clearly is significant to him and he felt that he was much more in control of things when he was with Nikki. It was a very different type of relationship, but it is divorce from, from reality. How do you suss out the truth of an interview or a confession when you, know, you might have investigators that are leading or you might have a subject who has changed his story multiple times? So when you have a you know, seemingly concerned husband calling in the disappearance of his wife and children, of course it's a missing persons case. So at that stage, when, the, when police officers were going to the house and they're looking round and they're seeing, well, hang on a minute, her handbag's here, her purse is here, her keys are here, her phone's here, the children's medication is here. Alarm bells start to ring. So it's right at the, the offset, you start to have every hypothesis that could happen in this situation or could have happened. So... He would be a person of interest right from the start, particularly when he says, and it's a throwaway comment when he says uh, to, a, to one of the police officers, when he says, who's sleeping in the basement? And he says, I, I was, and I am. And he says, why? Oh, this separation thing. And he kind of throws it away. But most investigators now and police officers, I've trained thousands of them all across the world, know that separation is a high risk factor. And women and children don't just disappear into thin air. Chris claims that she did not fight back. And I just want to get your thoughts on the significance of that for Shanann's mindset. Listening to what friends and people around her who loved her said at the time, she was with girlfriends uh, and had been away from Chris. And she suspected he was having a, an affair. So it wasn't news to her. She suspected all along and she had sent him messages. And again, text messages are very important. But she said that she did want to work things out and that he meant, you know, the world to her. But there was also a change in the text messages across time where she basically said to him that he seemed to be emotionally distant and that the relationship was one way and that it was all her having to do effectively the heavy lifting. She said, you're being a bachelor whilst I'm working hard. I'm you know, having difficult times with the girls, with the children, and I'm trying to uh, work for a living and I'm carrying our third child and you're off living this bachelor lifestyle. So something cemented in her head that actually this relationship was a one way relationship. And I think that is very illuminating because abuse isn't just about someone uh, being physically abusive to someone. It can be withholding. It can be giving someone the silent treatment. It can be uh, not having, not meeting that other person's needs. It can be being very selfish and wanting your needs met all the time. And so that can be very isolating for a person. So for Shanann, I think she did realise the writing was on the wall. You know, she had said to him, I don't think we're compatible anymore. She wasn't getting what she needed. 
And it wouldn't surprise me if it came from her saying, I've had enough of this, the finality moment. I've had enough of you. You told me you're, you've been seeing someone else, that you don't love me anymore. And I think he was straddling her at the time this conversation took place because he said three times in in the the interview in February that he was straddling her. But he doesn't he says that the time that 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 happened uh, was when they were having sex. But it was in the morning when they had the heated argument. And I actually think it was one event. I think the him killing her happened earlier on when she came through the door. I think she did get into bed. And I think that she did probably initiate sex and she was trying to see where the land lay. But when he was not forthcoming and said that I don't want to be with you, I don't love you anymore, I think the finality aspect did kick in. And she probably said to him, I'm keeping the children and I'm not going to let you have custody of them. And I'm going to take them and and that for him, because he had always said in the text messages back to her, he'd take the time to reply, but he would say the children are my life. They're the light of my life. And so for him, not having control of the situation and her saying, this is what I'm going to do. And she'd been talking to her friends saying that she would file for divorce and she would try and get full custody of the children. For people who kill their families in general, or, or specifically Chris, are there inklings that this person would be more likely to kill or is it still hard to pick up on? I think whenever you get a long protracted history of, of domestic abuse, and I'm talking about coercive control, coercive control correlates significantly with homicide. You know, we see it in 94% of the murders. So where there's a power imbalance, where there's codependency, where someone's isolated, where they have no financial uh, depend independence, they have no uh, social uh, network around them, perhaps there are rules and regulations laid down for the victim and the way that they live. Uh, those signs are normally there. I think the more challenging cases are those where there is somebody who is more emotionally repressed and emotionally remote. And I think the dynamic, for example, with Shanann, who everybody says was a people person. She was so bubbly. You know, she was the life and soul. She kept a beautiful house. She was a brilliant salesperson. You know, she could sell you the clothes that you're already wearing back to you. And that's an example that Chris gives that really brings her to life. Everyone loved her. Now, their dynamic attracts because he's emotionally remote. He's quiet. He's the rock. He's, you know, the somebody who feels very safe and stable to Shanann, I would imagine. And so they complement each other. But, but what I would say is that anybody who is emotionally remote, uh, it might seem an attractive quality to begin with, but it's a, it should be one of concern because it means that they don't have the depth, they don't have the full range of emotions. And it means at some point those things are gonna bubble up to the surface. And it might not be in terms of a homicidal event, but normally when it happens, uh, it's not good to be around. They're kind of like smoldering volcanoes. We started talking about how can we reframe the case to make sure it's about remembering Shanann and her children and not referring it to the Chris Watts case? How can the media, how can the general public do a better job of doing just that, of remembering Shanann and her children? It's a great question, and I've been thinking about that a lot, Stephanie, particularly as Lifetime have just announced the Chris Watts movie. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I struggle with giving a, a platform and notoriety to individuals who, uh, I mean, in, in the relationship for eight years, both families said that that he was a good man to the children and to Shanann. But I don't believe that this just came out the blue. Always behind closed doors, there's another picture. And I think he was emotionally remote to Shanann. I think she was the one that had to do all the heavy lifting. And I think we need to honour her memory of who she really was and paint more the picture about her and who the children were than talk about Chris. You know, I, I don't think it's such a... Uh, mystery when you work domestic violence cases and when you understand familicide which like I said is a rare event this isn't one of life's real mysteries this is a man who wanted to take control of the narrative does he deserve a movie to be made about him I don't believe he does but if we recenter the victims and we keep talking about them um, then a different story starts to emerge and I don't think we should be giving him 
this this platform or even this kind of mystique about well who was he and he's such a mystery and it's so intriguing and it's such an incredible case of true crime it's not it's somebody who brutally murdered his 15 week pregnant wife who had come home from a business trip at 2 a.m in the morning and had been working hard to keep the family together i still think that people feel it's at the point of separation that everything gets better and it's actually at the point of separation much more uh tension risk and concerning behavior escalates particularly if you have this finality aspect of it's definitely happening and there's children involved and there's pregnancy and there's a control dynamic so, you know, again, I'd refer people to look at the DASH, the Domestic Abuse, Stalking and Harassment and Non-Based Violence Risk Model, um, because we do see, in, in particular, coercive control being missed a lot of the time, the non-physical aspects of abuse. And there's so many different types of behaviour, but it can be dressed up as something else. So, again, you know, when we see headlines, what drove this man to murder? Challenge it. Nothing drove a person to kill another. That's a choice. It's a decision that they took. It's a conscious decision. There's nothing another human being can do. It's what they decided to do. And, and homicide does not happen in a vacuum. You normally see the behaviours prior to that if you know what you're looking for. And, you know, I think too often we see these headlines and we see cases being covered that people, that it's very misleading. And coercive control and stalking are the two things that get mi get missed over and over again that that's something i would really like to see change and i'd like people to to challenge that narrative and challenge when we see perpetrators being held up um, and their dominant narrative and normally it's a false forensic narrative being put at center stage disregarding the facts and the evidence of a case of what really happened I think it's all of our responsibility to do that, to challenge that injustice and to honour the, the true victims in these cases. And in this case, it's Shanann, Bella, Celeste and Nico.